Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Would someone please shoot me a chat message if you can hear me and if you can see the course roadmap, please. Perfect, thank you for the sound and video check. So let's start with a couple announcements. The Simulation Lab 3 is posted, so I'd recommend getting started early on that, uh, j just like the other labs. The pre-lab is really important for understanding the lab itself, and there's a little design problem as part of the, the pre-lab, and then you'll exercise that design in, in the lab. So take a look at that. I recommend getting started early on that and take a look at the homework that's coming up. So it's homework five is due tonight, so uh, take a look at that. My office hours will be right after class today as usual, and if you have any questions during class, please unmute or shoot me a chat, and if I don't see your chat message, uh, definitely unmute. Otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background noise low. If I drop off, Due to technical issues, as always, I'll try to get back as soon as I can. If I'm not back in a few minutes, that's a bad sign, but I, I haven't had any problems so far, knock on wood. Uh, and so let's, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep up that track record. Okay. So I wanted to put the, the course roadmap uh, up here. Uh, so we've covered basic electrical theory, analysis of DC circuits, transient circuits, uh, analysis of AC circuits, that was phasers and impedance. And during the last class, we actually start in, started into uh, semiconductors. And so we covered diodes. Diodes were a, uh, I called it a one-way valve for current. And we talked about how to use diodes to convert AC into DC using a rectifier, including diodes and a capacitor. So that's that's the really the, the simplest uh, semiconductor, but very useful. And so today we're going to start into transistors. So what I want to do now is give you an introduction to transistors, and we're going to concentrate on one transistor in particular. It's called a bipolar junction transistor. And I'm going to give you a fluid flow analogy. Um, and I think this helps with understanding and getting an intuitive feel for how bipolar junction transistors work. Okay, so you should be, you should be uh, hearing me without an echo and seeing my, uh, my slide right now uh, that says transistors, introduction and fluid flow analogy. And uh, if, if, again, if you ever can't see the slide clearly or you hear me with like an echo, like my headset is not on or my uh, microphone input has switched to something else. Please let me know. Okay, let's start off with an introduction to transistors. Um, this is the schematic symbol for a transistor, and we'll talk about this more. This is, in particular, a bipolar junction transistor. All right, so we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, transistors in general are semiconductor devices that control the flow of current, right? So you're going to electronically control the flow of current with a transistor. And there are several different types of transistors. Uh, there are bipolar junction transistors, BJTs. There are MOSFETs, uh, that's a field effect transistor. There are different types of field effect transistor, MOSFETs and JFETs. In fact, there are different types, two different types of bipolar junction transistors. There's an NPN bipolar junction transistor and a PNP bipolar junction transistor. We're gonna concentrate mostly on the NPN, uh, November, Papa, November, NPN uh, transistor, uh, that type of BJT. It's, it's the most common for simple electronic circuits. And if, if you wanna look into something like motor control, um, in fact, we'll talk about this a little bit, using MOSFETs for motor control, uh, then you, you can get this all over the web. But but once you have kind of an introduction to BJTs, you, you can sort of figure the rest out. But it's good to have an introduction and get a feel for these. Okay, so <clears throat> bipolar junction transistors do this. 
they use a small amount of current into one of their terminals to control a large amount of current into another one of the, their terminals. So it's, you know, if you translate that into what we've done already, it's really a current controlled current source. And we will work an example of that. And so, uh, let, so this is the bipolar junction transistor schematic symbol. Let's name the terminals. So the upper terminal right up here, that's called the collector. Uh, the, the terminal to the left is called the base, and the terminal at the bottom is called the emitter. Okay, so the way you remember this, the base is always kind of the, the one in the middle connecting to the, the, the flat side. Uh, the emitter always has the arrow. Okay, you'll see for an NPN transistor that arrow points out. We'll talk about that. And the collector is, well, the other terminal up here. So the emitter has the arrow, the collector doesn't. Um, we'll talk about uh, a couple currents and a couple voltages that they're commonly used. You can imagine there's three currents here and three voltages you could, you could define, but most commonly we're going to talk about the collector current called IC, which goes into the collector, okay? And we'll talk about the base current IB, which goes into the base. Uh, and so those are the two currents we'll talk about primarily. The, the two voltages we'll talk about primarily are the base to emitter voltage, VBE. There's the double subscript notation creeping in, remember from the first class. And so uh, the positives at the base, the negatives at the emitter, that's VBE. And we'll also talk a lot about VCE, the collector to emitter voltage. Okay, so so we'll work with this, and, and a preview is you're going to use base current to control collector current, right? And both of those come out as the emitter current. So the emitter current comes out here, right? Both of those currents combine, and they come out of the emitter. Oh, the, that emitter current doesn't show up too much in the equations we're going to use, so I'm not even calling it IE, but you could call it I sub E if you if you wanted to, but... But just know that the IC and IB combined together, they come out of the emitter. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a more intuitive feel for a bipolar junction transistor. Okay, so this is going to be a fluid flow analogy. So imagine you have a tank. This is a really bad cartoon of a tank, right? So it, it holds fluid, and let's call it water. So you have water filling this tank, right? It's orient is shown, top is the top, bottom is the bottom. Um, let's imagine you drill a hole in the bottom of this tank and you put a big pipe. Okay, so water wants to flow out of this pipe because of gravity. Um, and so, uh, so there you have a, a, you know, a simple fluid system. Now let's do this. Let's, let's insert a valve in this big pipe. So the valve uh, would go right here. That's what this little slider is. It's a slider valve. So I could imagine there's some way to seal this and I could slide the valve in a little bit or I could slide the valve all the way in and cut off the water, right? And if I slide the valve out a little bit, it lets some water flow, right? And then slide the valve in, stop the water. So it's an adjustable valve. Okay. Uh, now let's concentrate on this valve itself. Let's zoom in on it. So, so here it is, the valve is closed, and if I open it just a little bit, I get some fluid flowing. Let's say in that position, it's like 100 gallons a minute. And if I open it a little more, more fluid flows. Maybe that's 200 gallons per minute. And if I open it all the way, I get 300 gallons per minute. Okay, just a, that's, a, that's a flow of water. And imagine the valve is all the way open, and that's all that can flow, 300 gallons per minute, because the valve is all the way open, and and you know you have a certain size pipe and water, you know, and a tank above and gravity, and so and if I start closing the valve here, I'm back to 200 gallons per minute and 100 gallons per minute, and then I cut the fluid off. Okay, so so that's this big valve. That's the valve we're going to control. Now imagine you drill a hole in the side of this pipe and you seal it up. So, and you, you put a little pipe and that pipe might be, I'm kind of exaggerating it, it to scale here, but it might be a hundred times smaller in diameter. And so, 
and that pipe goes somewhere else to some other fluid source. Okay, in this little valve right around here, I'm going to insert uh, what I'm gonna call a flapper. And that flapper is hinged right at the top here where that circle is. And, and if you put uh, a little pressure on it, let's, let's say this flapper is spring loaded. So it's spring loaded to be closed like that, to close off the pipe. But if you push on it a little bit, uh, the flapper opens, right? And if you push on it a little harder, the flapper opens even more. And if you push on it hard enough, the flapper opens all the way. So you're pushing this open, right? And and if you let some pressure off, you let some force off of it, the flapper starts closing. Remember, it's spring-loaded and, and less pressure. And then you take all the pressure off, you take all the force off, and the flapper closes. So this flapper, instead of my hand or my mouse pushing on it, it's going to be controlled by actually fluid that, that I'm going to control at some rate going into this pipe. So if I put a little bit of fluid, let's say uh, one gallon per minute, right? If I put one gallon per minute through this little pipe, that flapper opens up just a little bit. If I put two gallons per minute, the flapper opens a little more. And if I put maybe three gallons per minute, the flapper opens up all the way. So I'm actually, right, I'm, I'm controlling this flapper uh, with the position, with the amount of fluid flow, the amount of current uh, passing through this little pipe, okay? So, and then, uh, okay, so now let's do this. Uh, let's, let's get rid of this fluid up top, let's get rid of the flapper fluid, and let's install this linkage. This linkage, it's drawn as a cartoon here. And what it does is this, it connects the flapper so that the flapper can control the position of the valve. So, so if I do something to open this, this flapper just a little bit, it slides the valve out a little bit, right? And if I push on the flapper a little more, open it a little more, it slides the valve a little more, right? And if I push hard enough and I open the flapper all the way, the valve is all the way open. So imagine that, imagine you have the system that you can control that big valve with this little flapper here, okay? So, and it's, it's I show it discrete steps here, but it's really kind of a continuous motion, right? So, okay, let's put the fluid back up top, okay? And then let's, let's let some fluid flow through this little pipe. So what this means is that I can control, right? Uh, this flapper with the amount of current flow, the fluid flow through this little pipe, and that opens up the valve and controls this bigger amount of flow. Okay, so so if I uh, have a little bit of fluid flow, the valve opens a little bit, right? A little bit of fluid flow through this little pipe, big big valve opens a little bit. A little more fluid through the little pipe, big pipe opens up, right? And then there's some point where I put so much fluid through the little pipe that the valve's all, all the way open, okay? So you can see what I've created here is is I've I've created a way to use a little bit of current, a little bit of fluid flow, to control a lot of current, a lot of fluid flow. Okay, it's essentially what a transistor does. Um, so so let's talk about modes of operation of this pipe system. They are going to map directly to modes of operation of the the electronic transistor situation. Um, so if you have zero gallons per minute flowing through the small pipe, the flapper's closed, the valve is closed, then the big pipe has zero gallons per minute. And so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna name that, we're gonna call that cutoff. No current flows through either pipe. And, and so that's just zero, zero, the zero, zero case. If you, if you start flowing fluid through the little pipe, right? We're going to call that the the, the linear mode. Uh, so if the small pipe flow is one gallon per minute, then it opens up the valve a certain amount, and that's that's a hundred gallons per minute in the big pipe, and it's linear. So if you if you put two gallons per minute through the small pipe, you get two hundred gallons per minute through the big pipe. Okay. So so see it's it's linearly controlled from cutoff. Put a little fluid in, and then it's proportional. Okay, and, and we're going to say the big pipe flow here. In this case, it's that valve is set up in this flapper such that you get a hundred times the small pipe flow through the big pipe. Okay, so you, I mean this is intuitive. You can kind of imagine building this uh, and, and making it work. Um, 
so there then there's a point where okay there, there's another case these these modes cut off linear there's a case where you put so much fluid into the small pipe that that flapper opens up all the way and it opens up the big valve all the way okay so you have three gallons per minute flowing through the small pipe that opens up this valve totally and you get 300 gallons per minute flowing through the big pipe the flapper and the valve are fully open um, and this is called saturation you've saturated it's called saturation because if you put more small pipe current right through the small pipe that will not cause any more big pipe current right i could put more current here right put more current in four gallons per minute uh that doesn't cause any more current to flow into the top here now you get a little more current flowing out of the bottom but remember it's like 300 gallons per minute and and 100 times less so really there's a kind of a you know almost a negligible amount of additional current flow flowing out of the bottom even uh, when you increase the small pipe flow, but see, I can I can just increase the current here. I can increase it to five gallons per minute, and the big pipe valve is already all the way open. No more current is going to flow through the big pipe into the top. Okay, and that's where we're measuring the current. Uh, that's called saturation. Okay, so we have these three different cases. So first, we have a little flapper controlling a big valve. It lets you control a lot of current with a little current. Uh, and then you have these three modes, cutoff, linear, and saturation. So let's finally make the analogy. Um, let's talk about the transistor, the NPN bipolar junction transistor. I'll show you what NPN means in a minute. Um, so, you know, I, I named the base, the emitter, and the collector before. So here they are labeled. And I can draw the analogy to the fluid flow. Uh, situation where, let's see, so where I've I've got the fluid flow situation where the top of the top big pipe, the top of the big pipe is the collector, the uh, bottom of the big pipe is the emitter, and the the base is the little pipe. Okay, so that's exactly like it is over here. You're going to control a lot of current, a lot of electrical current into the collector and out of the emitter, and you're gonna control that collector current with the base current, right? Just like over here on the left, okay? So let's name the currents, just like we did before, IB and IC, right? So on the left, if I make the analogy again, you use base flow to control collector flow, right? Use base flow to control collector flow. Um, so here on, on this side, on the right, you use base current to control collector current. Use IB to control IC, okay? And so uh, here, here's where it all comes together, right? On, on the left, I said the collector current, the collector flow was 100 times the base flow. Well, that is modeled well over here on the right. The collector current is 100 times the base current, or IC equals beta IB, right? Beta is that proportionality constant. On the left, it was 100. Uh, beta is that proportionality constant between IC and IB. It's usually a big number. It's usually like 100 or 200 or 300. And so the collector current is 100 to 300 times larger than the base current. Okay. So, so if I have zero milliamps going into the base, right, um, then I'll have zero milliamps going into the collector. IC is beta IB. Um, that's cutoff. That's the cutoff condition. And then if I increase base current a little bit, 0.1 milliamps, right? I see beta IB, I get 10 milliamps flowing through uh, the collector, right? And I get 10.1 milliamps flowing out of the emitter, but it's almost 10. It's just like the situation on the left where you had the valve, the flapper open a little bit, the valve open a little bit, okay? And so if I increase IB a little bit, then IC should increase. So you increase IB, IC increases, right? I IC is beta IB. Um, so if I have 0.2 milliamps going into the base, I have 20 milliamps flowing through the collector. So I'm controlling this collector current with this base current, just like over on the left. I, I'm controlling this big pipe, the big tube current with the little tube current over here. Um, and But 
Now there's a point, right? Just like over here on the pipe case where you've essentially opened that valve up all the way. There's a point at which this transistor, uh, you put base current in and for a particular circuit, you hit a maximum on collector current. On the left-hand side, it's just like you have a valve that's always open. Um, so someone asked the question, is, is, is it always linear? Like, is this relationship always linear? Well, in the real world, nothing's perfectly linear. Uh, when you treat it as linear, it works good enough. It works well enough. Um, and I'll show you some transistor curves in the lab, and, and you'll see, well, it's a little more complicated than this. But this is great for design purposes. It works well. I've done lots of designs using this linear relationship. And let me say, it's, it's, it's linear. It's linear until you reach saturation. And once you reach saturation, uh, you know, this valve is all the way up on the left. And for the particular circuit, you have as, as much current flowing into the collector as you can have. It's limited, actually, by things external to the circuit. Um, and so at that point, uh, you could even put more base current in. So here's where it becomes nonlinear. You could even put more base current in. Let's put 0.4 milliamps. Uh, right, 0.4 milliamps doesn't change IC. And I'll, I'll go through an example in a schematic of this, but you can change from 0.3 to 0.4, and the collector current doesn't change. Um, it's just like the case on the left, right? You put more base flow in, but the valves are all the way open. You're not going to get any more collector current. Now, my analogy, right, there are things you can do external to the circuit uh, to make more current flow, but we're talking about for a given circuit. On the left, there are things you could do to make more current flow. You could push harder on the water, apply more pressure on the water up top. But let's, let's, let's say for a given situation, you've, rich, you've reached saturation, okay? And so, um, so when you've reached saturation, something happens. Um, VCE falls to a value, it falls to a minimum value. And we're gonna approximate that minimum value as 0.2 volts. In the lab, I'll show you, what we'll model a real transistor. And you'll see, well, it's not exactly 0.2 volts, but for design purposes, this works really well, okay? So, and if you wanna tweak it a little bit later with the actual numbers, you can, but this gets you really close. So, so let me go back, while, while you're changing for a given circuit, while you're changing uh, in the linear region, right? you're changing uh, IB to control IC, VCE is changing. Okay, I'm not showing it here, we'll go through an example, but VCE is changing. But the point here is that once you've reached saturation, uh, VCE falls to some minimum value, we're gonna call it 0.2, and at this point, right, you can see that I'm, I'm, change, oops, I'm changing between 0.3 and 0.4, and IC isn't changing. So IC is no longer beta IB. IC is actually less than beta IB when you're in saturation. So this, let me go back, IC equals beta IB only applies when the transistor is behaving linearly or actually in cutoff. So cutoff or linear behavior, IC equals beta IB. And then once you hit saturation, that goes away. IC is no longer beta ID once you're into saturation. Okay, and then when you're in saturation, VCE is some small value, like 0.2 volts. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so we're going to work a real example. But any any questions on this kind of this this fluid flow relationship here? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Regardless of what values IC and IB have, the, it, when it reaches saturation, the VCE is always going to be approximately 0.2 volts. Yeah, yeah. So for design purposes, it's about 0.2 volts. And, and, and what we'll see is actually that value changes as, as, you, as you change um, IC. And so I'll show you the real transistor curves. But, but when I'm doing an initial uh, transistor design and I want to – let's say control a motor or control an LED with just a little bit of current. Um, and I will, I'll show you how to do this, but what I'll say is my, my saturation voltage, my VCE in saturation is 0.2. Okay. So yeah, assume that for now. And then when we get deeper into it, you can use the real value from the data sheet. But what you'll find is things don't change that much if you just use 0.2. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Okay. Yeah, it, you know, a lot of uh, electronics work. In fact, I would I would claim that a lot of mechanical work too. Um, uh, you know, you can model the heck out of something, and then eventually you you have to make some design decisions or even simplifications uh, that 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 make your design go forward and are good enough. Sometimes you have more unknowns than a lot of times you have more unknowns than equations, and you just have to make some design choices. And then sometimes you could you could uh, what a friend of mine back in Virginia calls mouse milking, right? You could you could analyze this circuit to death. And if you change this between point one and point two, you know it doesn't change your final product at all. So, uh, so this is a good uh, rule of thumb for VC equals point two. Is a good rule of thumb for transistor design. Um, but let's let's take a look at uh, various views of this transistor, like physically. So here's here's the uh, schematic symbol that we we've been looking at. Let me draw a cartoon of this uh, transistor. And what this transistor is, and the reason it's called an NPN transistor is because of this. It's really three sections of semiconductor. So this whole semiconductor for a, a silicon transistor would be silicon material. And then you would have, uh, but you'd have three different regions. Uh, the, the emitter region would be doped or impurities would be introduced that would give it a, um, uh, it would be n-type semiconductor. It would have electrons as the charge carriers. The, the base uh, would have uh, holes, right? Lack of electrons, right? That's charge carriers. It's doped as a P material. And then the collector uh, is doped as an N material. And there's different dopings for these N material, different concentrations. But, but again, I'm not going to get into the deep semiconductor physics. I just want to show you well, why it's called NPN, then then a little view into it. Um, now, this is interesting because remember, you're having current flow from base to emitter, right? That's how you're controlling the collector current. A collector current is flowing uh, from, oops, from base to, or from collector to emitter. Well, what we just learned about diodes is you, you can't have current. If this were just a diode right here, you can't have current um, uh, uh, flowing from collector, right, to emitter because there's an NP, ju NP junction. You can have current flowing from base to emitter because this is a PN junction right here, right? Uh, this would be the cath. So imagine this, this just bottom two, these bottom two blocks here. They form a diode between the base and the emitter, and this is the cathode and this is the anode. So if it's silicon, it just looks like a diode with a 0.7 volt drop. But the collector, it, it actually looks like you're never letting current flow from the collector down to the emitter because you have an NP junction and that's reverse biased, right? If you, if you, tr you can't normally have a diode uh, flow current from N to P, positive current flow from N to P, um, that doesn't work. But what happens here is actually uh, the base, when you have current flowing from the base to the emitter, you're introducing charge here, right? And you're actually influencing these depletion regions. Okay, so you're, you're actually introducing charge carriers that allow uh, the flow of current from N to P here and then, then down to the emitter. And I'll, sh I'll show you that. That's why this is only a cartoon. This doesn't really show the true geometry of the transistor. So here's, here's another view. In fact, if you took a voltmeter, uh, multimeter, many of them have um, diode testers on them. And you could inv indeed verify between these two terminals, this looks like a diode, and between these two terminals, it looks like a diode uh, um, with with those senses, with those polarities of anodes and cathodes. Um, that So really, here's here's another view. This is really what the structure of a transistor looks like when it's, when it's created on silicon. And down at the bottom is actually a um, an image of one, and so so the 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 flow right of of base current to the emitter is actually influencing the um, the collector to emitter junction here, right? That's very narrow. So physically, it's influencing it with charge carriers, and charge can flow from collector to emitter. Okay, so this is just kind of a again a top level view. We're not going to study how it works. We're going to study how to use it, right? So from the perspective of 
uh, how a BJT behaves and how to use it as an amplifier and a switch electronically controlled. Okay. All right. So, um, so what I'd like to do now is switch over to the whiteboard. Okay, get the lights set up here. Um, okay, so right now you should see my whiteboard and with a transistor drawn in the center. And so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, this transistor. Again, let me know if it's out of focus or if you can't see some. Ooh, it looks like it's stopped. Hmm. Hmm. Worked well last class, but for the last lecture we had. Okay, so um, so what we have. So let let's talk about let's talk about the transistor for a second. We talked about. Uh, the relationship between uh, I, IB and IC, right? IC equals beta IB. That's the linear relationship, right? The linear relationship. And in, in so in saturation, right? VCE. Uh, is approximately equal, equal to 0.2 volts. Okay, this is VCE. And I want to write this, that in that case, if you, if you assume that beta is some relationship for a transistor, given for that transistor, it's usually a number like 100 to 300, uh, then IC, you would find out, is less than beta IB. Because as you increase IB, IC... Um, does not increase, right? Now, there's different ways of viewing this. You could cons you could say, well, wait a minute. I I see is always beta IB. It's just that the beta falls. That's another way to look at it. I'm going to consider here that we're going to just say beta is a constant value. It's the value that we want for IC versus IB. And in the case of saturation, IC is less than beta IB. Uh, that would be a specified value. Okay. Um, I want to also point out here this voltage VBE and the current IB. So remember this this looks like a diode uh, going from the base to the emitter. Right? That looks like a diode junction. And so uh, like tuck this one aside. You're gonna we're gonna use this in a minute. But the diode characteristic is such that if you plot uh, the diode current versus the diode voltage, right? This was ID, well, I got lucky last time, I guess, with my video. Um, so that this is IB versus VBE. Um, uh, in, in the last class, we called the, uh, the horizontal, uh, vertical axis ID, the horizontal axis VD, right? This is a diode junction. We just renamed the current and the voltage, and it's going to look, again, like that. So what we're going to do is for a silicon transistor, we're going to use essentially a forward voltage of 0 0.7 volts for silicon. Okay? So when we are designing a circuit, and we'll do this, uh, that introduces base current that controls base current we're going to assume that the base to emitter junction looks like a diode and it has a forward voltage of 0.7 volts for a silicon transistor okay all right um so so let's do something with that let's look at a real circuit
Okay, so let's assume we have a circuit that looks like this. We're going to control the current through a resistor using a transistor. Okay, so I have, let's move that down a little bit. Okay, so we have this transistor. Uh, we're using base current. I'll draw IB here, right? That's IB. And we're controlling collector current. That's IC right there. We have a source up the top. I'm going to say this is a plus 5 volt source up at the top. Um, and we have a resistor, we're going to call that the collector resistor, RC, and it's 100 ohms. Okay. We're going to call, control IC with IB. Um, and, you know, we can define the voltage here, VCE. Right. Um, and and so, so let's do this. Uh, let's... Let's start introducing base current and see what happens to the collector current and see what happens to the collector to emitter voltage. And what this is going to demonstrate is uh, cutoff, linearity, and saturation. Okay, so I want to I want to create a table here. I'm going to create a table of uh, let's see, IB. I'm going to control IB, um, and then I'm going to have IC which might be beta IB as long as we're not in saturation. And then uh, I'm going to define a voltage here called VX. Right? And I'm going to use that in a KVL equation. And so uh, VX, if you, if you just run Ohm's law, if you apply Ohm's law here, IC is going into the positive side of this VX uh, definition here, right? IC goes into the collector. So VX is equal to IR, IC, RC, right? So that's Ohm's law. And so uh, we're going to write down VX on this table, right? That's IC, RC. And um, then we're going to calculate from using VX and using the power supply, we're going to calculate VCE. And so uh, let's let's figure out what what VCE is. Um, <clears throat> let me point something out here. I've written the power supply. I've drawn the power supply as a node voltage at the top, right? So plus five volts just means I've attached a source. This is common in schematics. I've attached a source such that it's causing plus five volts node voltage at the top. I'm going to temporarily draw something in here. Uh, what's causing that? Five volts is this. It's it's actually right a, a five volt supply. Okay, um, so this causes the node voltage up at the top. That's really what's there. But a lot of times you just don't draw that in. It helps here if we want to write the KVL equation to relate VCE and VX and the source voltage. If I if I start here, let's say, and I, I, I write a KVL, uh, it's, I'd say minus 5 plus VX plus VCE equals 0. I'm back to the starting point. So, right, start here, minus 5, right, minus 5, right, plus VX, right, plus VCE equals 0. And so uh, VCE equals 5 minus VX. Okay. So that's what I need to complete my table. I need to, uh, some equation for VCE. So VCE equals 5 minus VX. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to write that. So here are, my, here are the col columns of the table. So we're going to do that. Um, <clears throat> okay. So let's start out by putting no current into uh, the base. Let's start with zero milliamps. 
Okay. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to assume linear linearity. We're going to assume IC is equal to beta IB. And then we're going to calculate VCE to see if that assumption was right. So in other words, if I assume some IB and IC is beta IB and I get, I, I get VCE as like, you know, negative one volts or zero volts, it can't be less than 0.2. Um, then I know I was wrong about IC equals beta IB, but let's assume it just to start out with. So, so IC is beta IB, uh, we think. So uh, let's see, we have, to, we have to define a beta for this transistor. So let's call this transistor uh, Q1. So Q is the designator for a transistor, just like R is for a resistor, C is for a capacitor, Q is, is that for a transistor. So let's say that um, Q1, like this would be on a data sheet, or if it's an exam, I would give it to you. Q1 has a, a beta of 100, okay? And, and it, it might say um, uh, VCE sat, right? VCE saturation equals 0 0.2 right? volts. And it might say, let's assume it's silicon. It might even give you uh, uh, the, the voltage VBE when current is flowing. Let's assume that's 0.7 for now. But we don't need to use that here. So zero milliamps flowing into the base. Let's assume IC is beta IB. Zero milliamps times 100 is zero milliamps, right? Um, and let's calculate the remainder of these values. So if I have zero milliamps flowing through IC, into IC, into, into the collector, I have zero milliamps through the resistor. So by Ohm's law, VX is zero volts. Okay. Um, by KVL, right, my KVL down here, uh, if you run that KVL, VCE is five minus VX, so five minus zero is five volts. Okay. All right, so since VCE is greater than 0.2, that means that that uh, IC is equal to beta IB. This transistor is actually in cutoff now, um, where IC is also beta IB. And, and, and so our assumption was correct. Let's increase, let's increase the current just a little bit, 0 0.1 milliamps into the base. Let's assume IC is equal to beta IB. So 100 times, 100 times beta, 100 times 0 0.1 is 10 milliamps. So we have 10 milliamps, we think. We have to check VCE. Well, to get VCE, we have to go through the VX calculation. I have IC uh, um, as 10 milliamps, and I have a 100 ohm resistor. So that means that VX is one volt. And by KVL, five minus one, four volts. So at this point, my VCE is, uh, four volts. It's above 0 0.2, so IC equals beta IB, linear, it's valid. Let's increase it even more, this base current, right? 0 0.2 milliamps. Let's assume IC is beta IB. Uh, that would be 20 milliamps. Right? And by Ohm's law, if you have 20 milliamps flowing into the collector through that resistor, I get two volts across that uh, collector resistor, okay? And by KVL, I get three volts VCE. So I'm, I'm, still, uh, I'm still linear. VCE is above 0.2 volts. It's right, the, the, think of the fluid flow. That big valve is not all the way open yet, okay? Um, and you can see how things are changing here. VCE is actually falling, so you can imagine that at some point we're going to put so much base current in that VCE has fallen to 0.2 volts. So you can kind of see that coming. Let's let's increase this current a little more. 0 0.4 milliamps. Uh, if IC is beta IB, you'd have 40 milliamps flowing through the collector into the collector. We have to verify that. VX 40 milliamps times 100 ohms, 4 volts. 
uh, VCE five minus four one volt. So VCE has fallen to one volt. And then um, let's let's pick a kind of a strategically chosen base current 0.48 milliamps. So if I have 0.48 milliamps flowing into the base, let's assume linearity. You would have 100 times that 48 milliamps uh, flowing into the collector. By Ohm's law, this would be 4.8 volts. Right here. Let me draw some. Let me just kind of draw a line here just to make my rows straight. Uh, and then VCE is 5 minus VX, which is 0 0.2 volts. So we have just reached the threshold of saturation. Okay. And it, so IC is still beta IB. If you increase IB just a little bit, it won't. So we're just on the, thresh, the threshold of saturation here. Okay. Uh, let's increase the current even more. Just like in the fluid flow situation, you can put more fluid down the fluid flow down the small pipe, you can put a little more, you can put more current base. It's not going to hurt anything until you heat the transistor up so much that you break it. But this is really, these are low, low amounts of currents here. And so let's, let's increase to 0 0.5 milliamps. Okay. And at that point, now let's assume linearity. We're going to be wrong, but let's assume linearity. Um, if IC is still beta IB, you would have 50 milliamps flowing into the collector. By Ohm's law, you would have five volts across uh, the, the, the resistor, right? And that would mean you'd have, by KVL, zero volts VCE, collector to emitter. Well, that, that can't happen, okay? Um, the, the properties are such that uh, for a transistor, for a silicon transistor, you can't fall much more than uh, to much more than uh, below 0.2 volts, right? You definitely cannot fall to zero volts. So this is not right, right? This is not right here. That can't happen. So what you say is, okay, uh, VCE can't f fall below 0 0.2, so we're going to call it we're going to call it 0 0.2. We're going to say it's at 0 0.2 because the transistor is saturated, and then uh, but working backwards using KVL, if you have 0.2 volts across VCE, then this isn't 5 volts, this is 4.8 volts, right? And by Ohm's law, if you have 4.8 volts VX uh, across a 100-ohm resistor, then you have 48 milliamps, okay, flowing... Uh, into the collector. So, so this saturation, this VCE is limiting how much current can flow uh, into the collector. And so what happens is look from IB to, uh, from 0.48 milliamps to 0.5 milliamps, we increase the base current, collector current did not change. Okay, let's, let's even increase that a little more. Let's, let's put uh, um, five milliamps, right? Let's put a whole bunch of current in here. You're not gonna hurt the transistor with five milliamps. So for, for 5 milliamps, uh, you would have, let's see, IC equals beta IB, you would have 500 milliamps, right? Half an amp flowing into the collector. Uh, by Ohm's law, 500 milliamps through 100 ohm resistor would be 50 volts, right? And then by KVL around that loop, you would have... Uh, a VCE of minus 45 volts. So that can't happen. You can't have negative 45 volts for many reasons across VCE here. So that's, that's not going to happen. It's going to fall. VCE is going to fall to a minimum of 0.2 volts. That means because of Ohm's law working backwards, you're going to have 4.8 volts across uh, the resistor VX, which means by Ohm's law, you have 48 milliamps flowing into the transistor, uh, into the collector. Okay, so this is an extreme example where, where you put a lot of current and you increase the current significantly of the base and collector current did not change. Okay, um, so, so this, is a, this, this is a good demonstration of 
uh, let's let's name these regions uh, right here. Right, the cutoff is that 0 0.48, 0 0.48 milliamp. That's linear. I'll try to fit it in here. That's linear, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna write up here. This is cutoff right here. Right, that's cut off at that uh, level where you have zero milliamps. And then right uh, above uh, 4, 0.48 milliamps into the base, that's saturation. So S-A-T, that's saturation. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, so w what if we do 0.49 milliamps current? Okay, if you do 0.49 milliamps current, uh, then, VX would try to be 4.9 volts, right? VCE would try to fall to 0.1, and we're making the assumption it can't fl fall below 0.2. So you would set VCE to 0.2, right? That would force um, VX to be 4.8 and IC to be 48 million. Uh, 48 milliamps, so you're not going to exceed 48 milliamps. And now, so when we look at the real curves, there, it's 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 not as clean cut as 0.2 volts. Um, when you when you right around 0 0.48, 0 0.49, the transistor is gonna it's going to become nonlinear, but it's not going to be a hard cutoff like I'm showing it here of of linear versus saturation. It's going to become nonlinear. But, but we'll see that if you were to use five milliamps, you're definitely into saturation for this, this transistor. And, um, and, and I'll show you what that means, why you would use that. Okay, a um, couple things to notice here. I want to connect this back to the circuits part of the course. So notice that uh, in the linear region, you have one current, a base current, IB, controlling another current, IC, right? There's a current in the circuit that is controlled by a current somewhere else in the circuit. Where have you heard that before? That's a current controlled current source, right? A, a current is controlled by another current. That's the current controlled current source. Remember that we, we drew these diamonds with an arrow and we said, right? So, so if you say IC equals beta, IB, there you go. That's 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 what we've built here with the transistor. Okay. Um, and, and you could expand on this to make a model of this transistor. Uh, so also notice this that you have a voltage VX controlled by a current. That's a current controlled voltage source, right? So now you have a voltage source where Vs equals you know, some value uh, times Ib, right? That's, that's a current controlled voltage source. That's what you built here, okay? And um, you have another voltage over here that's actually controlled by Ib. There's another current controlled voltage source. And you can imagine it, and we'll get there, but you could have a voltage on the left that changes uh, and causes the base current to change. And so you could have a, a voltage controlled current source and a voltage controlled voltage source. So you can make all four of those types of controlled sources using a bipolar junction transistor, right? So we draw them as diamonds in, in the circuits part of the course, and now you could actually build them with a transistor. This is one way you could build them. Um, so, so on that note, in the linear region, uh, what we what we typically do is we use a transistor in saturation to control a large amount of current with a small amount of current, either on or off. So let's suppose you have an Arduino and you have an electric motor. And the electric motor, let's say it's a tiny motor, but it requires 100 milliamps. Let's say it requires 100 milliamps of current to turn the motor for whatever load you have connected. And you want to control that with an Arduino. Well, an Arduino is going to output a few milliamps out of its pin maximum, out of its one of its ports. We'll talk about that. But but you know, if you've worked if you've worked with an Arduino, many students have, um, you, you uh, 
you know that you, you can turn on an LED with one of its pins with a few milliamps, but you're not going to output 100 milliamps. So a transistor is the device you put in between, and we'll show this, an Arduino and a motor in order to control a lot of current, IC, with a little current. And usually you're operating either in cutoff to shut the motor off, or you apply a voltage to drive the transistor into saturation to turn the motor on. Okay, and so um, let me write saturation here. In that mode, you're using the transistor as a switch. Okay, you're turning something on and off. You go into satur saturation or cutoff, and when you're in saturation, the current's flowing, so the device is on. In the linear region, well, it's linear. You, you change a little bit of current, right, to control a lot of current. That's an amplifier. So you can build an audio amplifier out of a transistor, right? This might be the microphone current, just a little bit of current coming out of a microphone. And IC might be the current going into a speaker, which is 100 times as much. So you can take a little bit of current to control a lot of current. And so that, that's, that's the linear mode um, versus the saturation slash cutoff mode. Okay, so, um, so that's what we're going to – we're going to focus more on uh, the – transistor as a switch and not so much as an amplifier. I'd encourage you if you're interested, there's lots of reading you can do on that. Um, but for amplifiers, what I want to talk about after transistors are op amps. So if I were going to build an amplifier for some project, I would use an operational amplifier. We'll talk about that later. So that's why I'm not going to cover transistor design uh, to make amplifiers, but I am going to cover transistor design to control devices with a little bit of current, okay? Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's do this. Uh, first, any, any questions on this? What I'm going to do next is, is work an example. Okay. Um, in fact, let's do this. Uh, the the example is probably going to take about uh, I don't know ten or fifteen minutes, and and that would uh, take us longer than I want to go in one straight lecture session. So so let's do this. Uh, let's take a ten minute break, um, and and then return and work the transistor example. So I see that the clock says 4.58. Let's round up to 4.59. So at 5.09, if I did my math right, at 5.09, uh, let's return here. We'll start up the lecture again. I'll keep the Zoom session open and go on mute. And uh, if you have any questions on this, I'll keep this up here. If you have any questions on this, if you think of any, then we'll, we'll start right into those. Okay, so I'll see you at uh, 5.09. Okay, let's get started back up here after the break. Um, could someone please shoot me a chat saying that you can hear me and see my whiteboard? Thank you. Okay, so now after you've had a little bit of uh, time to mull this over, um, does anybody have any questions on this transistor characteristic? Okay. Um, and again, if you have any questions you want to talk about, and anything you know that comes to mind, we can always talk after class at office hours too about this. Uh, so, so what I want to do is talk about using the transistor as as a switch. So what I mean by that is an electronically controlled switch that you could have just a little bit of current out of something like a microcontroller uh, control a lot of current, like the current to a motor. Okay, so let's get rid of this.
Okay, let's work this example. Okay, um, so what I have is, let's suppose I want to control an LED, uh, which requires 25 milliamps uh, with with a controller uh, that, can, that can only supply maybe, I don't know, one or two milliamps, right? It can only supply a few milliamps. Um, so let's, let's draw that out. It looks something like this. So here's the light emitting diode, the LED, and I want to control current flowing down through that from a five volt source down through a resistor. Down to ground. And connected to the base, I'm going to have a resistor. Uh, let's call that RB. And let's suppose that I have this node voltage V in. Uh, off to the left. So what I'm going to do is I'm, go I'm going to uh, turn on VN. In other words, I'm going to make VN 5 volts when I want the LED to light up. <clears throat> and I'm going to make VN 0 volts when I want the LED to turn off. And I want to do that with just a couple milliamps flowing into that base. Okay, so, so VN is either uh, 0 volts or five volts, okay? Let's uh, give some information about diode D1. So we're gonna say <coughs> diode D1 has a forward voltage uh, of, well, it's an LED, so it's going to be higher than 0.7. So it's forward voltage is 1.8 volts. So when current's flowing through it, you have 1.8 volts. Uh, across that diode. And then <clears throat> let's give some information on uh, transistor Q1. That's Q1. Uh, let's say beta is 100. Um, let's say that VCE saturation, VCE in saturation is 0 0.2 volts, right? That would be out of the data sheet. You could either look at a table or a plot in the data sheet to figure that out. Um, and let's also say that uh, VBE equals um, 0 0.7 volts when IB is greater than zero. So it looks like a diode. It looks like a silicon diode. It's a silicon transistor. Okay. And, and so what we want to do here, this is a, a design problem. We know we have a power supply of five volts. We know we have a control voltage of five volts. We want to design, um, uh, let me see if I can write it up here, find, so find uh, RC uh, so that the LED current is 25 milliamps when the transistor is saturated. So this is IC, that's also the diode current. When Q1 is saturated. Okay, so there's kind of abbreviation. Find RC so that IC, or the, the diode current, is 25 milliamps when Q1 is saturated. And then also find RB so that the transistor is saturated when Vn equals five volts. So how, how do we saturate the transistor? So find RB so that Q1 is saturated right, when, it's hard to write like this, when um, Vn 
equals five volts. Okay, so those are the two things we have to find, find RC and find RB. Okay, um, so let's call this A and B. So let's do part A. Okay, so um, here's what I need to do. I, I need to find some equation, some relationship that tells me when Q1 is saturated, um, some equation that has IC because I want 25 milliamps flowing, uh, and the equation with RC because I need to find RC to control the 25 milliamps. Okay, so, so I'm gonna do this. I'm going to write a KVL equation because I think a KVL equation is going to, ha it's gonna have a relationship between VCE, let me write in VCE here, right? Some relationship between VCE um, and VD, we know VD, what that's going to be when current is flowing. And we, we also know that the voltage across RC is ICRC. So I can write an equation. You know, I'll do this again. I, I won't do this all the time, but I'll draw in this source just to make the KVL equation a little more clear. So this is a five volt source, right? So uh, that's what's causing this five volt power supply. Let me get my camera back on. That's what's causing this five volt node voltage power supply at the top, that five volt supply. So my KVL is going to look something like this. Minus five plus VD plus ICRC plus VCE equals zero. Minus five plus VD. Are you seeing a lot of these equations show up that, that we studied during the circuits part of the course, just being able to do a, a KVL with a, with a node voltage? So minus five plus VD plus ICRC, right? Plus VCE equals zero. And so we're, uh, we're trying to solve for RC when IC is a certain value. Uh, let's just rearrange this equation. Uh, let's see, IC, RC equals five minus VD minus VCE. I think I got all the terms there. And so then we can say RC equals five minus VD minus VCE over IC, okay? So uh, we know IC, IC we want to be 25 milliamps. Uh, VD, we know that there's current flowing through the diode, so VD equals VF when there's current flowing through the diode. Uh, VCE, when the transistor saturated, it's 0.2 volts. Okay, so we have everything we need here. So this is going to equal uh, five, let's see here, five minus uh, 1.8 minus 0 0.2 over 0 0.025 amps, right? And if you do that division, you get RC equals 120 ohms. Okay, so, so if you saturate the transistor, 0.2 volts VCE, uh, and you have a 120 ohm resistor, then IC, the current through the diode, will be 25 milliamps, okay? So that's how you solve part A. So now we've designed for one resistor. Now we have to figure out what resistor RB do we need in order to saturate that transistor? 
when Vn is 5 volts. Okay, so let's do part B. So we, 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 need, we need to let 25 milliamps uh, flow um, when Vn is 5 volts. Okay. Um, so let's do this. Uh, let's write another uh, KVL equation. Why do I say that? Let me fill in some va values here. The voltage across this resistor, if you define the base current like we usually do, IB into the base, the current, in, uh, the voltage across that base resistor is IBRB, right? And then the voltage from base to emitter, right? It's right down here. Base to emitter voltage when you have IB greater than zero is 0 0.7 volts. Okay, let me just write VBE there because it's not always 0.7. It's not 0.7 when there's no current, but I'll write VBE. Okay, so I can write uh, a KVL equation that has IB, RB, VBE. Okay, so let me do that. Um, let's do a KVL. I, I won't draw the source here, but there's a source causing V in to happen. It's plus five volts. So I say minus five plus IB, RB plus VBE equals zero. Minus five plus IB, RB. plus VBE equals zero. Okay, so RB equals, that's what we're trying to find, uh, five minus VBE over IB. Okay, so we need to, we need to figure out what IB do we need. Um, well, so we know that this transistor is in saturation. And at that point, you could say IC is less than beta IB. This is the beta that you would use if the transistor were acting linearly. <clears throat> okay, so I can, I can rewrite that and I could say, well, that means that IB has to be greater than, uh, IB has to be greater than IC over beta, right? Okay, so IB has to be greater than uh, IC. We need 25 milliamps right? uh, for IC. And uh, beta is, well, 100. Right? So that means IB has to be greater than 0 0.25 milliamps. So if we have IB greater than 0.25 milliamps, in this case for this circuit, you will have saturated this transistor. Well, okay, here's one of those times where you don't have enough equations to solve for your unknowns because you can choose any value for IB that is greater than 0.25 milliamps. Uh, I could cho choose a half a milliamp, I could choose five milliamps. Um, it's, it's a choice. Well, okay, let's consider some practical applications here, or practical considerations. Betas vary over temperature. They vary from part to part. They may be a little higher than specified. They may be a little lower than specified. So it's probably good to put some margin in here. I wouldn't choose 0.26 milliamps because if beta is a little low, then you're not going to have the transistor in saturation. Um, I also wouldn't pick a huge current. I wouldn't pick like 10 milliamps, 20 milliamps, 100 milliamps, because then you're using a lot of power. Let's say this is a battery powered device. You would kill your battery uh, just, just trying to uh, drive base current. Or if it's, if it's an Arduino, you might be limited to five milliamps or 10 milliamps, something like that. So, so somewhere in a few milliamps is probably a good choice. I would feel comfortable. Uh, maybe a factor of four, I'm going to choose, let's say choose IB equals one milliamp. Again, you could choose two milliamps. Uh, there'd be more of a margin. You'd be safer if there were a lower beta. Um, uh, you know, you can choose a half a milliamp if you're really concerned about battery power. 
So I'm going to choose IB equals one milliamp. So that means that I could say, well, IB or RB, actually, I'm sure solve for RB. RB equals five minus VBE, right? VBE is 0 0.7 volts over one milliamp, 0 0.001, which is 4.3 K ohms. So it's RB. Okay, so if with the circuit, you use an RB of 4.3 K ohms and you apply five volts to VN, then you will have a milliamp flowing into the base and that will cause the transistor to saturate. That will cause VCE to be 0.2 volts uh, and, and that will cause uh, 25 milliamps to th flow through the diode. Okay. Any questions on this problem for this example? Okay, and if you have, if you want to talk more about this, then um, come talk to me at office hours, and we can draw on the whiteboard. Um, so just just to summarize, here are the takeaways for a transistor. It can be operated in cutoff, it can be operated linearly, and it can be operated in saturation. They're all valid points, valid places to operate. Um, when you're operating linearly, VCE is greater than 0.2 volts ish, right around that. And and if VCE tries to fall below 0.2 volts ish, uh, then you have uh, you put the transistor into saturation. Okay. When you're operating linearly, you're operating like an amplifier. Uh, when you're operating in saturation, you're operating like a switch, turning something on and off. Okay. All right. All right, so we'll see more of that uh, more of that later in lab. Oh, looks like I dropped off here. Okay. So let's get rid of this. Okay, so let's suppose you want to build an amplifier. Let's suppose that you have a circuit. You or now you have a sensor. You have a sensor that outputs something like a fraction of a volt. It outputs zero volts to zero point one volts, and it might be a pressure sensor. So maybe you've attached that pressure sensor to something uh, to, to to monitor pressure in some pressure vessel. And, and then you have a data acquisition device. And that data acquisition device actually spans maybe zero volts to five volts, right? So the, the sensor only outputs zero volts to 0.1 volts. And the data acquisition device spans zero volts to five volts. So you really want, you know, you're not using all the resolution that you could of that data acquisition device. So you would really want to make that, that output bigger, right? Larger in voltage. And so that's where an amplifier comes in. And you could do that with a transistor. Uh, that is, that is um, a, a way to do it. It's probably a, the harder way to do it compared to using an operational amplifier. Okay, so let's talk about operational amplifiers. Okay, also called op amps. Okay, so operational amplifiers, um, they are an integrated circuit. They typically come in a sort of a rectangular package with pins coming out on two sides. And you plug them into a breadboard um, or you solder them into a circuit board. And, and, and usually they have more than one op amp per integrated circuit. Uh, let's let's kind of 
let's just start in with a single op amp, define what it is, and define how to use it. Um, so an op amp is an integrated circuit. An integrated circuit means that uh, it is a circuit on usually a silicon die or other kind of semiconductor die with many transistors and maybe other components integrated uh, onto that silicon die. Silicon die is a little square of silicon cut up from a wafer. And it's put into the way we would see it on breadboards, uh, a plastic package or ceramic package sometimes with pins coming out. But the point is that an integrated circuit has a lot of transistors integrated put onto one part so that you can use it uh, as sort of a black box. So an operational amplifier functions as a high gain differential amplifier. Okay, P pick that apart. Uh, it's high gain. That means it, it, so a gain is a multiplier on voltage or current. This is a voltage gain in this case. A high gain means it multiplies the input by a big value. Differential means it takes the difference between two voltages and multiplies it by, well, a big, a big value. Okay, so that's what an op amp does. Uh, let's, let's draw this out, what an op amp is. I'm gonna draw it really big. This is the schematic symbol. It's a triangle. On the left, you have inputs. Okay. Uh, these two inf inputs are, are distinguished by two markings, right? Right now you can't tell which one's which uh, because either input could be on the top or the bottom. The way you distinguish them is one is going to have a plus next to it and the other one's going to have a minus next to it. Okay, that's how you tell the inputs apart. The input with a plus next to it is called the non-inverting input. Okay, the input with the minus next to it's called the inverting input. And so the inverting input goes with the minus, the non-inverting input goes with the plus. These two could be swapped. In other words, you could have the minus on top and the plus on the bottom, but just remember the plus indicates non-inverting, the minus indicates inverting, okay? On the right side, you have the output. Okay, and uh, two more terminals that sometimes aren't drawn and sometimes they're important, sometimes not, but they're always there on the real device. You have power supply inputs. And there are, uh, so, so there are ways to differentiate between these inputs. Uh, the way we're going to do it typically is we're gonna call one input VCC and the other input VEE. Um, on some data sheets, this is called V plus, this is called V minus, but that sometimes gets confusing with the inputs. Uh, so VCC is the positive supply. The positive power supply and VEE is the negative supply. These power the op amp. Okay, the, uh, in fact, we'll talk about this in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, the output will range between the positive supply and the negative supply. So if the positive supply is like 15 volts and the negative supply applies negative 15 volts, then the output could range somewhere between minus 15 and plus 15. But this is what, this is what powers uh, the amplifier. And this is called VCC because it depends on that, but there are collectors of transistors connected to VCC and there are emitters of transfer to VEE. So that's where those names are, they come from. Okay, so there's the schematic symbol and the names of, of the terminals. Let's, let's take a look at uh, 
what this does. Let's define some voltages. We're going to call the voltage the node voltage of the non-inverting input V1 and the node voltage of the inverting input V2. Okay. Uh, the output we're going to call VO. Let's just call it V out. And um, so V out uh, is, there's a relationship between V out and V in. Remember, this is a high gain differential amplifier. There's a high gain value. We're going to call that value AOL, the open loop gain. You'll see why it's open loop when we close the loop, but it's called the open loop gain. And V out equals AOL times V1 minus V2, right? So there's the, uh, there's the gain, and here's the differential part. It's the difference between V1 and V2. Um, AOL is a big number. And it, it often doesn't matter how big it is. It just matters that it is big, okay? Uh, and you can see it fall out of some of the equations, wh why they range between, why these values range between about 10 to the fourth, right, 10,000, to 10 to the sixth, a million. And they change from device to device and um, lot to lot, but but you'll see that it just matters that it's a big value. Okay, so so this is right here. This is the big takeaway from for what an op amp does. There's another way to write that. I want to show you this. I could define right. Remember, we can we can figure out voltage differences between node voltages. I can define the VID, which is the input differential voltage. That's what ID stands for. So VID is the input differential voltage. And uh, VID is equal to V1 minus V2. And you can see VID directly falls into the V out equation. So V out is also equal to V1 minus V, uh, that's wrong. It's also equal to AOL times VID. That's another way of writing the equation above. Okay. So this gain is usually too big. It's usually um, <clears throat> it's usually undesirable to have a gain that big. You know, my example before, you wanted to multiply 0.1 volts up to 5 volts. So what's that gain of 50 or something like that, right? Um, you don't want a million. You want 50. So usually op amps are used with negative feedback okay so usually no, lost my screen. usually we're going to do something to the circuit uh that that causes that gain to fall at a circuit level okay so so let's let's talk about that so any questions on the op amp before i erase this so so these are the equations we're going to use these are the inputs um now we're going to talk about a an analysis technique on, on how to design something with this. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's talk about negative feedback. We use negative feedback all the time. It's one word. So negative feedback, what it does is it helps you reduce the error in some kind of control system. So when you're driving your car and you turn on cruise control, there's an error between the speed you have and the speed you want, right? And that's an error speed, and you could translate that to an error voltage. So negative feedback is, is what causes the, the, you know, more power to be produced by the engine, the gas pedal to be stepped on by the car, by the cruise control, or or not, or reduced based on the error voltage. So that's what so that's what negative feedback is. Um, we're going to use negative feedback in analysis of 
uh, op amp circuits. And what negative feedback is going to do, it's going to allow us to control the overall circuit gain with resistors and actually reduce the gain to the value that we want. And so uh, let me draw, draw what negative feedback really is or what it looks like in an op amp circuit. So if I have an op amp, okay, and I have my two inputs and my output, I'm not going to draw the power supply here. Here's how you identify a circuit with negative feedback. There is some connection between the output, right, this is V out, and the inverting input, the one with the minus sign next to it. All right, so I'm just gonna draw a box here and I'm gonna say feedback network. And that could be, you'll see we have different, different things we can put in there, but if there's any connection between the output and the inverting input, then you have negative feedback. Now, if it goes through a power supply node or a ground node, that doesn't count. If there's, uh, if, if you can trace uh, your pencil along a connection and not actually like hit a ground or hit a power supply, then that's negative feedback. But in general, if you see any kind of connection between the output and the inverting input, you have negative feedback. And there's a, there's a, there's something that happens there. Um, if you look at, uh, let's just let's just consider this. Let's say that you have some V1 and you have some V2 and we have some VID resulting from that. What negative feedback does is this. Let's suppose you start out uh, V1 and V2 are maybe equal. So VID is zero. And then V1 starts increasing. Um, that means VID starts increasing. And if VID starts increasing, that causes V out to increase, right? V out equals uh, AOL VID, right? So VID starts increasing, V out starts increasing. Through this feedback network, that is going to cause V2 to start increasing, okay? If V2 starts increasing, it actually causes VID to decrease, right? Uh, so that's what this feedback network does. It actually causes VID to converge on a very small value. And we'll look at that value in a minute. It's like on the order of mi microvolts. Um, the, the takeaway here, again, without getting into the detailed analysis of this, and you'll, you'll see it through the examples, the, the takeaway here is that uh, with negative feedback, VID gets driven, gets changed to approximately zero volts. It's not really zero, it's a few microvolts, but it's, a, but it's really small, okay? Um, we're going to use that fact to analyze circuits with negative feedback uh, to figure out what they do and then learn how to design circuits using that. Okay, so let me, let me just write out some steps here. This is the process. for analyzing uh, circuits with negative feedback, op-amp circuits. Okay, so I'm gonna list out the steps here. Um, First, obviously, you need negative feedback. So you have to identify negative feedback. How do you do that? You, uh, you look for some connection between the output and the inverting input through some comp components. And I'll show you some examples. So identify negative feedback. But once you've done that, we're going to do a couple steps here. One, uh, you're going to uh, assume VID is approximately zero volts. Now it's not exactly zero because if it were exactly zero, if VID were exactly zero, the output would always be zero. That's not the case. In your analysis, you're gonna see that it's a few microvolts. Just assume it is equal to zero when you start the analysis. 
Okay, uh, step two is assume that the input currents to the op amp are approximately zero. Okay, let me, let me show you what that means. Uh, we'll, we'll call this I1, the current into the non-inverting input. We'll call this I2, the current into the inverting input. And we're gonna assume I1 equals zero and I2 equals zero. And that has nothing to do with negative feedback. That has to do with the characteristics of an op amp. Op amps typically have very high impedance inputs, right? If you have a high impedance or high resistance, either way, then you have very low current for a given voltage. These impedances, resistances are in the order of uh, maybe 100 mega ohms. So you might have nano amps um, flowing into the op amp. And so uh, we just say it's, they're, they're approximately zero. Let's call them zero. And then three, analyze the circuit. And by that, I mean KVL, KCL, dot, 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 right? Ohm's law, voltage division, whatever. Okay, so those, those are the steps. That's the process for analyzing op amp circuits with negative feedback. Okay, so let's put this into practice now. Let's, let's do something with this. Um, let's do an example. I'll put a name to this example in a minute. So I have an op amp. I have my inverting input on the, on the top on the left. Okay, uh, and and so I have a resistor here that we're going to call this resistor R1, this resistor R2. We're going to call the node on the left V in, the node on the right V out. Um, and I don't draw the power supplies on this. I'm, I'm not going to draw the power supplies because let's assume that the op amp is sufficiently powered. So whenever in your book or you, you see an op amp schematic and there's no power supply drawn, you just assume it's sufficiently powered such that uh, the output won't exceed the power supply voltages. Okay, so, so what we want to find here is the, uh, uh, we want to find a relationship between V out and Vn. We're going to find the voltage gain of the circuit. And that voltage gain we're going to call A sub V, and that's going to equal V out over Vn. Okay, what, what a voltage gain describes is what happens to the output voltage when you apply a certain input voltage. Another way of saying this is V out equals AV times Vn, right? Just what number do you multiply the input to get the output? That's what this amplifier does. It multiplies the input by a number. So we want to find that AV. Now notice that AV is not the same as AOL. AOL uh, is, is, is the gain that describes the output versus the input differential voltage, the voltage here at the inputs of the op amp. VN is a different voltage. VN is over here to the left side of, of that resistor. So VN is a different voltage compared to the input voltage to the op amp. We're finding the gain of the overall circuit, of the overall circuit, including the resistors from this node as the input to this node as the output. Okay, that's what we're finding. So we need some equation that has V out, some number, and then VN. So that's what we're going to do here. Okay. Okay. Let's, well, Let's ask ourselves, does this circuit have negative feedback? I claim it does because I see some connection between the output and the inverting input through resistor R2, but there is some feedback path there. Okay, so you can identify that this circuit has negative feedback. Then let's go through these steps over here. Assume VID equals zero. Okay, let's assume that. 
So I'm going to write here plus minus zero volts. Okay, VID is zero volts. I'll show you it's actually a few micro amp, uh, uh, micro volts, but don't worry about that now. Let's, that's going to be lost in the noise and the significant digits. Then you assume that uh, the input currents to the op amp are zero amps. Okay, zero amps in. Um, so, and now we analyze the circuit using KVL, KCL, Ohm's law. Okay, so let's do that. Um, let's suppose R1 and R2 are known values. You know, it's 10K ohms and 5K ohms or whatever. We want to find the relationship between V in and V out. So, I would suggest that one way to write an equation that has those resistances and V in and V out is to write a Kirchhoff's current law equation at this node here where I'm pointing, at the upper left node, or this node with the inverting input attached to it. So let's try that. Um, again, when you solve this and you haven't looked at an, uh, one of these problems before, you might just try anything and see if you, you know, see if you can write an equation that has all the variables you need. Um, just looking ahead, I think that that node's KCL will give me a, an equation that I can use. Okay, so KCL, um, and let's sum the currents, oh, let's sum the currents leaving that node, just like we do for node voltage analysis. Okay. Um, let's notice something first. Let's notice what the node voltage of, of this upper left node is. Well, the node voltage of the ground node is zero volts, right? The node voltage of the ground node is zero volts. That's by definition. The there there's zero volt difference between the ground node and this upper left node, right? Because that's the assumption. Assumption number one. There's zero volt difference between those two nodes. So I can say that this upper left node has a node voltage of zero volts. Right? You could run a KVL and figure out the same thing but there's no voltage difference between those two nodes. So if the bottom node, ground node is zero volts, then the upper left node is zero volts. Okay, uh, so we know the node voltage of that node. Um, okay, let's now write our KCL equation. So let's sum the currents leaving. I'm gonna sum the current leaving through R1 and the sum, uh, sum it with the current leaving R2 and sum it with the current going into the op amp. So the current leaving through R1 is its node volt is so zero minus V in over R1. Right, that's the current leaving to the left. The current leaving to the right through R2 is zero minus V out, right? This whole output node is V out. Zero minus V out over R2. Uh, the current leaving into the op amp is zero. So this is why we need all these assumptions over here to write this equation. So I've summed the currents leaving, set those currents equal to zero. So what I'll see is, let's see, uh, let's rearrange this a little bit. V out over R2 equals V in, uh, minus V in over R1. And so I could say now I get the, an equation in this form with an AV in it, V out equals minus R2 over R1 V in. Okay, so there's, there's an equation to remember. And you can see the gain AV, which is V out over V in equals minus R2 over R1. <clears throat> okay, so, so this is what it means. It means the gain of this circuit, the number by which the input is multiplied to get the output, the gain of the circuit is set by the resistors, and it's negative R2 over R1. And resistors are always a positive value in the real world, and so passive resistors anyway, and so the gain is negative, okay? So, so, so the gain 
uh, is set by those resistors. Now, if we were to plot this out, let's suppose let's suppose I have something like I don't know, uh, five k ohm R two and one k ohm R one. Right, that would be a, a multiplication by negative five. That would mean if I have an input, so if my input this is time. If I have uh, an input that looks like this, right, that'd be V in. Then I'd have an output that is that times negative five. So let me approximately draw that here, right? It would look like that. It'd be five times bigger in peak value and inverted, right? It's inverted. The red is inverted, V out, is inverted compared to V in. That's called, so this amplifier has a name that I alluded to. Uh, it is called an uh, inverting amplifier. So you could write that up top here if you're taking notes. This is a common op amp circuit. You're gonna see this show up um, again. This circuit that has these connections has this gain and it's called an inverting amplifier. Okay, and it, it, it does this. Okay, uh, l let me mention one other thing about this amplifier. I said, well, um, how do you know that this input is zero here? What, what is it really? Well, let's again use the example that, I don't know, R2 is equal to five K ohms, right? And R1 equals one K ohm, oops, K ohm. And that makes uh, AV equal to negative five, okay? And then let's assume V in uh, or V out, let's say the, the output voltage uh, is five volts. The input voltage is one volt. Right, that's negative five volts at that point. Uh, the input is one volt. And so, okay, what is what is the input differential voltage when the peaks at? You know, here up here it's five volts. Here up here it's five volts. Well, if you think about this, uh, a, a V out equals AOL times VID, right? And if V out is five volts. And AOL is something like a million, right? Remember, it's a big value. I'll just say it's a million. Um, then the input differential voltage would be five volts divided by a million or five microvolts, okay? So if you have an op amp with AOL equal to a million, the output, if the output's five volts, then the input differential voltage is five microvolts. That's really small. You know, that's way down on the significant figure list. If you're not working out to six or seven significant digits, then you wouldn't even notice that, right? So, uh, so that's why we can say that the the input differential voltage is approximately zero and not have, uh, you know, an inaccurate analysis. Okay. All right, um, let's see. Uh, any questions on this inverting amp? I'm gonna do one more example before we end the day. And we're going to use these same steps. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave this up here while I work the next example. Okay, um, so let's let's work one more example. I'll give a name to this when we're done. So this circuit looks like this.
And again, power supplies are connected, but we're not showing them. Um, R1 and R2 might be known values or values you're designing for. V in is applied directly to the non-inverting input. V out is, is the output of the op amp. And notice that V in is not the input differential voltage, right? The input differential voltage is between these two op amp inputs. V in is between, well, this input and ground, which is a, a different voltage. Um, so we, what we want to do is, is find the same thing. So find uh, the voltage gain or find a relationship between V out and V in. Okay. Okay, so let's do that. And again, you assume uh, the op amp has a big AOL value so that you can make these assumptions about negative feedback. First, we identify negative feedback. We, we try to look for some connection between the output and the inverting input. Right, so here there is some connection between the output and the inverting input. So we say, yes, this, this op amp circuit has negative feedback. And so let's analyze it using the negative feedback process. Okay, so step one was uh, assume VID is approximately zero. All right, so let's do that. So this voltage here is approximately zero volts. Let's write zero volts there. Uh, then we assume that the input currents to the op amp are approximately zero amps. Let's write zero amps here. And now we solve the circuit using KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, whatever we can. So this is another case where I think that in looking at the circuit, I can write a, uh, a KCL equation at this lower left node to find a relationship between V in and V out and some factor in that equation. So let's, let's just start noticing something here. Let's, so let's notice that I have a node voltage V in at this top left node. And there's zero volts between that top node and this lower left node, right? So this node is volt, node voltage V in. There's zero volts between these two nodes. So I could say that this node is also V in, right? Because there's zero volts between them. So they have the same voltage effectively. So, so now let's use that to write our KCL equation. Okay. Um, so that KCL equation, again, let's sum the currents leaving. So let's sum uh, the current leaving that way with the current leaving that way and the current leaving that way. So the current leaving uh, to the right through R2 is V in minus V out over R2. Remember that from node voltage analysis, right? V in minus V out over R2. V in minus V out over R2. Uh, the current leaving down is V in minus zero over R1. The current leaving into the op amp is zero. Sum those together, set them equal to zero. Okay, so I can multiply both sides of this equation. Well, yeah, both sides of this equation by um, R1, R2, and I wind up with, let's see, R1 times V in minus V out, right? Well, this term becomes R2 V in equals zero. So I get R1 V in minus R1 V out plus R2 V in equals zero. Let's move the output voltage uh, to one side here. Let's say R1 V out equals, so on the other side, R1 V in plus R2 V in. Okay. Divide both sides by R1 V out equals, it's an R1 there, oh, R2. R2. 
Okay, so V out equals, and again, I can, I can uh, let's see, uh, R1 plus R2 is what we had on the right times Vn over R1. And so we've got an answer here. We've got uh, V out equals, I could say that this is, if I divide R1 in there, R1 plus R2 over R1 Vn. Okay. Oop, I gotta put parentheses there. Okay, so that's that's the big takeaway uh, in the gain for the circuit is one plus R2 over R1. Okay. And so we, f we found the gain for the circuit. Um, if you notice, the gain is a positive value because resistors are positive values. I'm adding one plus a ratio of positive values. So the gain is a positive value. So if I had something like, I don't know, um, R2 is 4K ohms and R1 is 1K ohm, then I would have a gain of positive five. So if I were to plot this and see if we can fit a plot over here, I think I can. All right, if I were to plot this, then I would have uh, an, an input that might look like that, Vn and an output that would be, that would have a positive gain applied to Vn, right? So you'd have a, a bigger version of Vn and that would be V out. And the waveform would not be inverted. It would have the same sense, the same sign. So this is actually a non-inverting amplifier. Okay, so there's a name for that circuit. So when you have, when you see this circuit with those connections to an op amp and a couple of resistors, um, you can call that a non-inverting amplifier, and then you know the gain, right? If and if you don't remember that, you could always derive it again. But this is a this is a common op amp circuit. Okay. So these are two examples of analysis of a negative feedback op amp circuit. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to continue this next time with, well, um, what are, what's kind of the decision tree, right? What, how do you, how do you decide how to analyze an op amp circuit? So I'll show you that. And I'll also show you other op amp circuits that can be used to perform comparisons. So you can compare two voltages. So you can make, you'll be able to make an electric circuit, electronic circuit that can make decisions based on input voltages. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, any uh, any questions uh, before we end class and move on to office hours? Any questions you'd like to ask about these circuits or op amps in general uh, while we still have class open, or or again, you could wait until uh, we're at office hours too. Okay, well, so um, thanks for joining the, the live class. I'll start office hours in a couple minutes. Uh, take a look at the upcoming assignments. Remember homework five is due tonight. Take a look at lab three um, and, uh, and be safe, uh, be healthy, be safe. And I will go on mute now for a couple minutes and then rejoin office hours at this uh, same Zoom session. Okay, so if you'd like to stick around to ask some questions, ask some questions or listen to other people's questions, you're welcome to do so. So I'll see you then in a couple minutes.